Sergey, in 2023, the S&P Insurance Stock Index returned 6.4% in what analysts have described as a boring year for insurance companies. Does that boring year continue in 2024? Absolutely. Uh, we might even see even higher performance in 2024, partly because insurance returns are also driven by the market in general. So if you're an insurance company and you have certain reserves that sit on your balance sheet, you actually invest them. So if the market goes well, you do well as well. And I believe that over the last year, the insurance index actually outperformed the financial index in general. So that means that there was some investment return plus some good underwriting return. I think 2024 is going to be a really good year. Just to give you an example, and actually that's some people don't think about insurance the way I think they supposed to think about it. So let me just give you an example. So in 2023, if you look at the hedge fund industry, you know, they live and die by their returns. And if you look at the top 20 hedge funds, the average return for 2023 was 10 or 11%. Let's make it 10 and a half percent. You have insurance companies posting results where they made record profits. It was Munich, Re, Swiss, Re, bunch of others. But the, the recent one, which really impressed me was Beasley, which is an, an insurer based out of uh, Lloyd's of London. And they posted 71% combined ratio. So what does this mean? That means that for each dollar that Beasley collected, they paid out 71 cents in losses and expenses. So they kept the rest for themselves. So it's equivalent to 29% return. That's two and a half times better than the top 20 hedge funds. But nobody talks because, you know, insurance is boring. How about that 30% annualized return? So I think the insurance industry is fascinating when you actually realize how it operates and how profitable it can be. And yeah, I think 2024, 2024 is going to be a great year. It just underperformed the S&P, but the big difference between the insurance and the, making the money in the float, there's no MAG-7. Remove the MAG-7 from the S&P 500. Yeah. The S&P insurance stock index did pretty darn well for 2023 because 2023 net premiums grew by 8.9% from $746 billion to $813 billion. The premium growth was mainly driven by rate increases, principally for personal lines of business, private passenger auto, and home insurance. Is there capacity in the market to continue raising those prices so insurance companies can make more money on the float? When you see the premiums go up, you should also think about losses. Yeah, the insurance industry collected more premiums, but did they pay more losses up? And the increase in premium over the last year, which by the way, for personal lines of business, if we take, let's say auto, some rates like New York and New Jersey saw the increases of 25, 30% for personally owned autos which is crazy. And also the homeowners, you have carriers pulling out of Florida and California, which is also crazy. And I think that the premium increase was primarily driven by higher losses. And also inflation didn't help, of course, because it becomes harder to repair things, to repair cars, to repair homes. So I would say most likely things since the inflation didn't go down that much, the trend is going to continue. There's going to be another year of premium increases, probably another 8%, maybe seven and a half, seven percent or so. And it's understandably so. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough on policyholders when it comes to personal lines. And I think everybody can feel that. So that's on the on the premium side. On the capacity side, I can speak to the commercial lines capacity if you want me to. And Please. you know, it's a it's a marketplace. There are providers of capital, there are consumers of capital, and the capacity comes and goes. So as of today, as far as I know, the capacity for certain lines of business like a management liability or directors and officers liability is pretty good, meaning that the insurance companies or reinsurance companies are willing to write a lot of policies at good rates. Meanwhile, the capacity for cyber has been limited because of the higher losses. And if you want to go and build a cyber program or build a new cyber product, it's going to be harder to find a reinsurance for that. Auto has always been tough. And actually, there is like a handful of insure techs that either went out of business or started seeking strategic options that were in the auto space. And it's just very hard to disrupt auto. I'm not talking about AVs. We're going to talk about that separately. But if you want to start a new auto program, a new auto product, and try to go against Progressive or Berkshire Hathaway, good luck. Incredibly tough. So I think capac oh, capacity for auto is always going to be a problem. I mean, in general, it's hard to to gain capacity, to get access to capacity if there is either no new market opportunity or no true underwriting differentiation. And if you have that, you'll find the capacity. If you don't have that, you're going to have a hard time. From the cybersecurity capacity standpoint, what happens? This is an if, this is not a statement, this is a, a what if scenario. 
Mm -hmm. the unfortunate incident in Baltimore involving the Mershik ship. If that turns out, initial reports are saying that it is potentially a cyber attack. If that was indeed confirmed a cyber attack, what happens to the capacity in the market? Because that's going to be a pretty substantial payout there. Well, most likely what's going to happen is that whoever was the policyholder and whoever is responsible for that particular situation, they might even max out their limits. And those carriers that backed that company, they're going to sell ripples to the marketplace and start thinking about, well, we haven't really thought of cyber attacks on the infrastructure that's going to lead to bridges collapsing and people, carriers are going to get scared or they're going to put more restrictions around cyber. That's kind of what happened before. There was like a uh, ramp maybe from 2015 to 2020. A lot of insurance policies were written for cyber. And then from 20 to 20, 2024, that's when the losses came. And that's where everybody pulled back. And I think that might even worsen the situation. My prediction, my opinion is that sooner or later, we're going to see cyber coverage being mandated at the federal level for every single policy that you purchase. It's similar to how you have to purchase the terrorism coverage. It costs you like, I don't know, 20, 30, maybe hundred bucks per year, but it's mandated. You have to purchase that. Similar is going to apply to cyber. And whenever you purchase insurance, you're going to be covered for extreme cyber events like this, where if the insurance company cannot pay, the federal government will have to stop, step in and do something about it. I think this event in Baltimore will set some precedents and the insurance industry is going to watch that closely. I mean, look, you're going to have, I know that there is a carrier that released a cyber product for your auto and you can buy this as a bolt on addition to your traditional auto insurance policy. We're going to see more and more cyber attacks on the edge when certain assets get hit, cars, vessels, pieces of the infrastructure. And I think we have to see the worst. The cyber on the edge for auto, is that for com commercial auto or is that also offered for, for personal auto as well? It is for commercial auto. So you can add cyber to your commercial auto insurance policy. I don't think it's available for personal yet, but it's just a matter of time. It's just, it's just harder to do something like this for personal because you have to go through all the insurance departments in every single state. But it is available today for commercial, yes. So if your car or anything that has to do with your car when it comes to your entertainment system or infotainment or your car being even the digital key, that could be considered to be a cyber hack. And there is a policy now that covers that. It's aimed at fleets, the large commercial fleets. Let's look at Pepsi, for example. They're one of the largest commercial privately owned fleets in, in America. Is that an example, something that a Pepsi might consider? Absolutely. Actually, any fleet. The thing is, it's all going to depend on the model of the vehicle that you have in your fleet. If you have uh, vehicles, let's say they were produced in 2020 or after, there is going to be cyber exposure. So it makes logical sense that if you buy a commercial auto policy, you should either have some form of a cyber endorsement to the policy, or you should have a separate policy that's going to cover just the cyber incidents with the vehicle. And I think, you know, what's the average vehicle life cycle? Is it seven to 10 years? Give it, give it till. 2030, all of the fleets, most of the fleets in the United States will be exposed to this and you're going to have the cyber coverage for auto, for commercial auto being pretty much a standard. It's just, it's going to be the new norm, similar to how we talked about cyber being mandated at the federal level for all commercial policies that they write for extreme events like this. Same is going to be with auto. Is cyber mandated for underwriting of autonomous vehicles, aut aut autonomous trucks or any form of automation operating on public roads? No, it's not. It's recommended. It's not mandated. And every single AV developer or operator, if they have a risk manager or if they have a broker, they should definitely get cyber. It's hundred percent because AVs are going to be prone to cyber hacks. And trust me, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of people who will try to interfere with autonomous vehicles when they are actually on the road. Same thing that happened with that vessel in Baltimore, the same thing with AVs. Because we're, we're talking about economics of insurance here. Obviously there's risk in, involved in underwriting and autonomous vehicle underwriting, especially when you get to thousands, tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of vehicles. What does the capacity look like today to underwrite Tom's vehicles and trucks? And how do you see that changing as the technology evolves and scales? The capacity is very limited, extremely limited. That means that there is only a handful of insurance carriers who are able and willing to underwrite the space. And well, outside of Coop, I can say that's Travelers, Liberty Mutual, maybe the Hartford. And we work with carriers at Lloyd's. So there is a couple there and that's pretty much it. I think it's not going to change the capacity side of things. It's not going to change dramatically this year. It's going to be as is. In my experience, most carriers have a herd mentality and you cannot blame them for that. They will not make a move 
into a new class of risk until the risk uh, reaches a certain tipping point or becomes ubiquitous. But usually it's that's when it becomes too late, which is understandable. But also they will miss out on the market share and on the underwriting profits. So I would say this year we shouldn't expect any changes, maybe 2025, 2026, when we're going to see more activity in the, on the capacity front and probably not for on-road AVs necessarily, but for robotics more broadly. Where do reinsurers fit into this picture? So reinsurers pretty much take the risk on the back end. So if you're an insurance company and you provide an insurance policy to the customer, the reinsurance company, well, you'll pay them some premium and they're going to take that risk. It could be 95% of the risk, 90% or 100% of the risk. And typically there's going to be multiple reinsurance companies. So they're going to slice the pie in a way that any single loss will not be too much of a hit to you. And the two biggest reinsurers in that space are Municree and Swiss Re. And both of them have been in the sector for a while. And they also work not just on the commercial side, also on the personal side of things. And I think those are the two reinsurers that actually have expertise that is necessary to build successful programs and products. Same we work with one of them. So yeah, uh, but other than that, I don't see any other players in that space, at least for now. How do the economics work when it comes to underwriting autonomous vehicles and trucks on the backside of that as a follow-up for automation and robotics in general? Is it a, as a standard template? How does the underwriting process work? from an economic standpoint? Typically, the way it works is that you have a customer, it's a commercial customer, they have certain needs and certain pain points, and you have an insurance product to multiple insurance products that you can sell them, and you sell that through the broker. And so the customer gives you data. Sometimes it could be like a bunch of PDFs. If it's more sophisticated, you have real-time data sharing through an API, and then you use the data to understand the risk. And you say, okay, I've collected 100 million data points. I know this fleet pretty well. And on the back of that, and also any additional qualitative evaluation that you do, you say, here's how much premium we're going to charge you for that free fleet for the next 12 months. Okay. And let's say they pay a certain premium, I don't know, let's call it a million dollars. So the insurance company collects that million dollars and usually 25 to 30% of that really depends on the arrangement gets paid out as a compensation for the distribution purposes. So that's for the broker or maybe for the MGA in the middle. But 20 to 30%, that's what's called the expense ratio. So the insurance company is left with around 70% of the premium that goes to them. And then they use that money to cover their own underwriting expenses and also to use that cash to pay out the losses that might arise out of this account or out of other accounts. So they pretty much pool that themselves. And then if the losses happen, of course, you have to pay out. And then there is a metric called loss ratio, which measures, okay, how much money has an insurance company collected versus how much they paid? And if they collected more than they paid, then they made underwriting profit and also vice versa. And so when it comes to the economics of the transaction, that's how it works for any insurance transaction. So it works the same for underwriting autonomous vehicles or robotics. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to results, that's when they, that's where, the, where, where everything uh, is different. So typically, if you look at the average, let's say property and casualty results, the loss ratio is around 70%, maybe a little bit more. And the expense ratio is around 20 to 25%. So when you combine all of that, on average, the combined ratio is 90 to 95%. That means that an insurance company makes anywhere between 10 to 5 cents on a dollar. That's the average result over the past 10 years or so. Don't quote me on that. It's just an approximation. So what we're seeing from the autonomous vehicles today, and I cannot talk for other carriers, but if I talk just about our results, the average, the industry average loss ratio is 70 the robotics loss ratio that we have is under five, under 5%. So that means that the robotics companies are an incredibly attractive uh, class of risk. And why that happens is because for them, safety is the number one priority and performance of the system. And it's not the case for other lines of business. If you are not safe or not good enough to go commercial, you just cannot make money. And that's what insurance wants you to be. They want you to be uh, redundant and have uh, all the tests in place and show that you are a, an insurable risk. Usually if you buy, let's say, personal insurance, you, they're required to, and, oh, I'm just going to drive however I want, the insurance will pay. So there is a misincentive, uh, misalignment in incentives to just, you know, take more risk if you know that you have the insurance. In the robotics industry, it's the opposite. You know, you're pretty much aligned with insurance to be very careful about, about the safety of your system. And that's what drove, I believe, the, the stellar performance that we have so far. 
Um, I mean, to be honest, we, we yet to scale and we yet to reach the tipping point of where we can write a billion dollars worth of insurance in the robotic space, but the early results are pretty promising. What you're describing to me is clearly insurable yet. Travelers Liberty Hartford are the only ones that you said that are insuring this. I met with Chubb, a big insurer run by in Greenberg last year. And I said, you insure in Thomas vehicles. I was nearly laughed at. We're not touching that risk. And you could put in a few favor of your four letter words as this individual is very excitable explain this to me. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a clear no. Okay. It, what you're describing, we know from the industry, but why are more underwriters not underwriting this when safety is so critical to this industry and this whole industry is aligned on safety and they all agree one bad actor takes the entire industry down and they're not doing anything bad? I think it's, there are two things, the lack of expertise and also just the organizational bureaucracy. When it comes to lack of expertise, if you think about a robot and when you try to compare a robot to a human, you can use the behavior of the human as a predictor for something bad that can happen. And that worked pretty well in the auto space where if you track the driving behavior of a person, you can pretty accurately tell with what probability that person is gonna get into an accident. If you do the same thing for robotics, you realize that the the behavioral triggers that lead to accidents for humans are not present in robotics. And that's why we're seeing the results that we're seeing because the robots just only gonna do what they're programmed to do. And the only thing you need to do, you need to have enough redundancy to make sure that the system goes to the minimal risk condition and you need to be able to have humans who will recover the robot or like tr troubleshoot the robot or remote operate the robot when the robot gets stuck. And I think if you have the expertise to understand the behavior of the robot, which requires you to access the data coming from the robot and also understand all the technical things that surround that, you'll get comfortable with the risk. That's exactly what we did. And probably the reason why you got that answer from Chubb is because they were not in a position to, to do that. And it is going to be a technical problem. So you cannot just look back and say, oh, you haven't had a loss in the last five years. Cool, here's a policy. No, you actually need to understand the performance and the surrounding safety of the system. So it's going to be technical, technical expertise. And when it comes to the bureaucracy, you know, um, big insurance companies, they, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I believe until there is a tipping point or there is some singularity moment or the moment when those things become ubiquitous, they will be very reluctant to take the risk, primarily because how big this is going to be, what are the historical losses, were there any litigation precedents? If it doesn't check the marks, they're just not going to touch it. And luckily for Coop and, and other insurtechs, that's the market that we can conquer. And by the time they make a move, uh, it might be too late. Because if you look at Chubb, they're very good at insuring art. They're very good at insuring jewelry. They're very good at insuring estates. There's some things that are very public that Chubb's got $100 million in, in one painting. There's exposure there. We, we saw what happened uh, when Steve went, well, I think it's the Picasso, put his elbow to the Picasso and, there, and Chubb had to pay that claim. So obviously there's not the expertise inside of Chubb, inside of various other insurance companies. Does that make Coop an acquisition target where one of these large insurance companies scoops you up to build out that autonomous vehicle division because you have the clear expertise on how to underwrite this risk? It is possible. So is it is it possible? Is it zero or one? Yes, it is possible. Is it probable? I don't know. I think the way it's going to play out is that, well, first of all, as of today, I believe that Coop is already the number one AV and robotics underwriter in the U.S. when it comes to traction and data that we have and also the expertise. And I think the robotics insurance industry, which in my view includes autonomous vehicles, is going to be dominated by a company like Coop that's going to own most of the market. And the moat is going to come from data and also from the tools that our customers use. It will be hard to go away from those tools if you want to switch. And eventually, give it 2025 to 2026, a couple of years from today, you'll see the carriers realizing that, oh, robotics is actually a thing maybe we should look into. And they're going to, they'll have to make a decision. Do they do it themselves or do they do it with somebody else? And I'm 99% sure that it's going to be more economically attractive to do it with somebody else like Coop be that some form of a partnership, investment, or even with the reinsurance program, then try to do it themselves. Because again, it's going to be a lot more technical solution than they've encountered before. It's even more technical than telematics that a lot of companies got comfortable with. So I would say we'll see what their future holds, but if those carriers start to move and they will want to work with Coop, we will be more than happy to entertain partnerships, especially on the reinsurance side. And we can grow organically to the point where we can become 
big enough to just profitably exist for decades. So yeah, I guess it's a, it's like a no answer to your question. So I cannot predict the future. The only thing I can predict is if we can build a good, good business, then the insurance companies will come to us. Good businesses are profitable businesses. And when you have a good profitable business, you have options in order for you to maintain a good profitable business. You have to manage your risk. How are you pricing? You do underwriting. Great question. That's pretty much the, the secret sauce. Uh, overall, which it's, it's, it's not a big secret, but what we've found is one way to underwrite an asset class where there is no historical data is to understand how that asset performs at the technical level. And what we were able to do, we were able to build not just an underwriting methodology, but an actual system. It goes all the way from data intake through the API to data cleaning and standardization to analysis and eventually pricing and underwriting where we can take data from the robots and understand how those robots be, whether they on the road or off the public roads. And we use behavior as a way to predict losses. Now, if you look at humans, you can see that there is a lot of data available on how certain behavioral events lead to bad outcomes. And, you know, at the very, at the simplest level, what you can do is you can take the robotics behavior and the human behavior and just do a diff, look at the difference. And that diff is pretty staggering. More broadly, if you look at different behavioral events, the robots are anywhere between 40 to 70% better than humans. They're only going to improve. And this eventually will find its way to pricing. And we already have precedents where we were able to provide some meaningful discounts to customers based on that. And of course, the technical evaluation, the qualitative evaluation also helps. So that's how we do it. And we, we believe that's the way, that's probably the only way it can be done. I do not really see the historical way make sense because the software is going to improve a lot and you'll see the improvement a lot faster than you'll see the historical data piling up. So you have to have the way to evaluate robotics behavior to be able to press that correctly. How does underwriting change from off-road to on-road to warehouse automation? How does it change? The model doesn't change. So it's the same approach. The liability exposure changes. So for example, if you operate within the warehouse, first of all, there are fewer humans that you can run into, right? The worst thing, well, if you run into a human, the worst thing that can happen is the death of a human being, but that's going to be a very rare event. Okay. We haven't seen anything like this. The most typical event will be some third-party property damage, and you can fix that relatively easily. Also the constraint environment, lower exposure, and also the policies that we write for warehouse automation offer for robotics, they tend to be capped, meaning that there is a certain limit that you cannot blow through. When it comes to the on-road autonomous vehicles, the limit is not capped. So if you have an auto insurance policy, you have a limit on a per occurrence basis, but you do not have an aggregate limit. So if you have 100 accidents happening at the same time and every accident is $1 million, you're going to pay $100 million. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, uh, the tough part about, about that. And um, you have that on the, on the uh, public roads end where you have robots operating there. And then you have the simple environment, low exposure, low exposure to bodily injury, medical expenses that is capped. And you kind of just adjust accordingly, but use the same methodology for underwriting, which is looking at the performance and the behavior of the robots. I'm going to throw another in ingredient here in into the salad. Full autonomous, no driver on public roads. Waymo's doing it today in mm -hmm. several states. Kodiak and Aurora both publicly announced that they're going to go drive route for a class eight autonomous trucks in Texas. The liability exposure is changing as you go drive route. How are the insurance underwriting requirements going to change? Great question. And there's going to be a lot of activity on that front in the next few years. And partly Coop is driving that too. We believe there's going to be no major changes to the policy language itself in the near future. So that means that if you have an a commercial auto insurance policy, and that policy says driver, that driver means, usually, typically it means a human being, but in, in the case of Aurora and, and Kodiak is going to mean the AV driver, Kodiak driver and the Aurora driver. The only thing that's going to change is that the regulations that those policies have to meet, they might change in terms of the, how much insurance you have to carry. So for example, if you operate in a state and you have a truck, you must show at least, I think the lowest requirement is like seven. $150,000 per state. So maybe for autonomous vehicles, they'll bump it up to 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, and that's going to be coming from the state. So you just need to make sure that you as the AV developer can obtain a higher limit policy. So 
that's what's going to happen on the policy front. No major, no major changes. Everything on the back end is going to be different. So first of all, if you are an insurance company providing the coverage for an autonomous truck, how are your underwriters comfortable around the risk? Do they have the data? Do they know what data to collect? And when they have the data, what insights they have from it, how often they collect the data to spot any pattern changes in performance. If an accident were to happen, how would you pull the video data? Are you going to analyze the video data yourself? We have to ship it to the third party administrator who might not even have any idea about how to operate with the video sensor data. And then all of those things on the back end will need to change for the autonomous vehicle insurance sector to become workable. And I think that's where a lot of insurance companies right now are thinking about how to get this done. And then eventually, I think we're doing R&D work in that space, but eventually we'll have a policy that's going to be purpose-built for autonomous vehicles. It most likely will combine auto insurance, errors and emissions, and cyber in one. It might have a different limit structure, and it's going to be the language that explicitly acknowledges different autonomous vehicle use cases. But most of the policy language is going to stay the same. It's just going to be a few bells and whistles that we're going to add to it and probably make it usage-based. So to make it convenient for the developers. But other than that, the policy language for auto uh, is going to be mostly recyclable into the autonomous vehicle space. With higher limit policies, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? So it's a capacity question. Is there enough capacity in the market to support these higher limits? As of today, I think no. And that's because there is not enough interest in the space, I would say so. So the insurance companies are just in a waiting mode. If you're willing to pay up, sure, you can find a syndicate that will take on your excess limit that you need to place. And if you're willing to pay, sure, you will probably find something. But this is more of a an exception than a rule. I would say if you want to place, let's say, $100 million worth of insurance, you'll have to spend a lot of time looking for that. It's not readily available. And justifiable so. That's probably going to change over the next few years. But as of today, it's extremely tough, I would say. How is Waymo getting the capacity? Are they syndicating it? Are they self-insuring some of it through Alphabet? They have a very public relationship with Swiss Re. Did they take the whole thing? Because Waymo is the largest driver of fleet in the world. How are they insuring? I cannot speak for them. I don't know exactly. But if I were to guess, most likely it's the Alphabet's captive involved. And they take on the primary risk, meaning that if let's say you have a um, 5 million auto policy attaches to every single Waymo vehicle out there, the first million or 2 million can be taken by Alphabet and the rest can be taken by some excess syndicates who will slice that and split the losses when those come. You can think of it as the self-insurance route. You self-insure the primary layer and then you go excess in case something really bad happens. It's about the economics. So if you are, let's say, AV developer, let's say you're Waymo, and you look at the marketplace and you're like, oh, geez, I cannot find a primary insurance policy that's going to cost cheaper than what I can do internally with my captive. Then your decision is, sure, go the captive way. When the industry gets to the point where there is a provider out there, be that Coop or somebody else, where they can deliver the cost of insurance that's lower than the internal captive can offer, you go and switch. And then you might go back to captive again. It's all about the economics at the end of the day. I think the, the job of the insurance marketplace is to become very smart and have enough data and expertise to offer a product that is cheaper to buy than to do yourself. And that's partly what we're trying to accomplish with Coop. You have to have the expertise. There's a very large truck OEM and they're public SEC. These are public SEC filings. I, I'm, I'm going to quote, we'll remove the company from this, but I will quote this. End quote, we are the leader in autonomous trucks, quote. However, this company has vetoed their partners yeah. from going drive route in their truck. There's a, there's a clause in the contract. They're, they're legally able to do that. They're not the leader. Aside, does insurance underwriters have a similar ability to veto the ability to go drive route either in a class eight truck and passenger cars or anything in the underwriting language that gives them that authority to say, no, no, you can't do that? Great question. I can tell you that if you are an AV company, and you spend hundreds of millions of dollars on R&D and you're ready to commercialize, the last thing you want is to have an underwriter tell you you cannot do this because your policy is insufficient. That is just plain stupid. What's going to come down to is the insurance company that you work with is actually being fully aware of the risk. And sometimes they might get that awareness from using the tools, sometimes just from having a conversation with the leadership and say, hey, we're going to go driverless. We want to make sure that your guys are fine with it. 
And then the insurance company will acknowledge that they are ready for you to go driverless and just please keep us posted on how things go. I would say that we saw examples on a smaller scale when robotics companies were unable to commercialize because they were unable to secure an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And that was a contractual requirement for the pilot. And that was incredibly sad to see. It's like literally you put everything you had into making this pilot happen, which could lead to your next round of funding. You cannot do this because some syndicate out of Lloyd's of London takes nine months to provide you with a quote. That's insane. And that's, by the way, what we're trying to solve. I would say it's, it's going to come down to the AV company itself, making sure that they have a good relationship with their underwriters and everything is clear. Theoretically, it can happen. Practically, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think you're going to have an underwriter veto an autonomous vehicle deployment. Unless there is a bigger problem. And the bigger problem could be that the insurance lapsed or they haven't had the right coverage in the first place. And that's when you start involving the legal matters more so than anything else. If there is hesitancy, does Coop step in and start to gain some of that market share since you have a clear understanding of automation, autonomy, and the risk, and you do underwriting? Yeah, absolutely. Where we come in is we operate as, a, as an MGA. So we are a managing general agency. We focus on the robotic sector, including autonomous vehicles. And we do everything when it comes to data sharing, pricing, underwriting, and managing customers, managing policies. And then we partner with companies like Lloyds of London and some reinsurance companies on the back end, and they actually pay the claims when those claims happen. So you get the best of two worlds. You get the biggest reinsurance company with tens of billions of dollars on the balance sheet. And you get the convenience and the pricing of the latest and greatest technology. So we definitely try to step in as much as we can. And I believe today we have the most robotics companies as our customers. And give it a couple of years, we're probably going to have all of them as our customers. And even today, which I believe we are in a scaling mode, we already solved a lot of problems. And the biggest problem that was solved by far is the availability of insurance. So sometimes companies come to us desperately like, we cannot get insurance. People think we are uninsured, but we're like, let's take a look. And then boom, 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 boom. Actually, you're a great risk. Here's the policy. And we had a lot of customers say thank you to us for how fast we were and how fitting we were to their needs. And that's, of course, something we want to build on as we scale. There are new classes of insurance today dedicated to automation and autonomy. You have historical lines, you have liability, you have DNO, you have cyber, but are there lines now dedicated just to autonomy? in automation from a policy standpoint? As of today, there is no necessarily a new class, but there are new branches. So for example, what we've done with the robotics industry is that we took a uh, errors and emissions policy and we branched it out and we called it robotics errors and emissions. And we've written some language, we added a few modifications to the policy. And now the policy is capable, not just of covering companies that develop or operate the robots, but actually covering individual robots as well. So it's like the way you cover your fleet, you have individual vehicles on your schedule, you can have individual robots and we'll cover every single one. In that regard, we had to build pretty much a new policy. But is it like a completely new policy? No, it's a modified policy. So the same is going to happen with autonomous vehicles is that it's going to be a branch of a commercial auto policy or motor carrier policy with a tweaked language and a few modifications added to it. And it's going to be acceptable by most of the states and most of the customers because it's going to have the standard contractual language coming from ISO, which is universally recognized, plus some additions that will be custom manuscripted by the insurance providers. So in that regard, it's kind of yes and no, but there are new products and we already have a bunch on the marketplace today. On the other side, how should companies prepare for automation autonomy from an insurance perspective? Because there are certain companies that are not automation, not robotics companies. They're starting to introduce robotics into their workflows, into their operations. How should they prepare for it from an insurance perspective? Great question. We have, so here's an example. We had a customer, it was in the construction robotic space, and that customer built a robot that did some something in the construction space. And they tried to sell that robot to a customer. And they were unable to do this because their customer's insurance company told them that if they get this robot, that they will cancel their policy. Imagine building an incredible piece of, uh, hardware and software and you're about to sell it. And then your customer tells you, sir, we cannot buy this. Our insurance company will cancel our policy. Uh, that's where, by the way, our policy can solve this because we can cover, um, the, uh, the liability coming from the robot without disrupting your customer's insurance program. 
So I would say things like that, you need to watch out for those because it probably will happen. If I am, let's say a restaurant and I decide that, look, the labor costs are going up, I would like to transform half of my restaurants into the robotics based restaurants where there's going to be a robot doing some, some cooking. You're going to have your insurance company asking you a lot of questions about that. And up to the point, they will not renew your policy. That way you either have to convince them or you either have to go to specialist providers like Coop and get this done. But honestly, I think the, when people will actually feel this is when we're going to reach the singularity moment, when the robots will become very good and very ubiquitous. And then you're going to have companies that are not robotics companies, but they use a lot of robots. And that's when traditional insurance companies are going to be caught off guard because, hey, I'm insuring a, let's say it's a professional services company, but they actually use three different types of robots to perform some cleaning service or some lawn mowing service or some other service. And that's when things are going to get interesting and give it 10 years. Is it going to happen? When does AI come into the picture? If, if we talk about AI in its latest iteration, meaning the tool that is able to provide you answers and write code for you and give you some content. I would say there is a very fascinating intersection of, uh, you probably have seen figure. They've, uh, were able to use opens AI GPT-4 model to take in instructions, and then they would go and turn that into actuation. And they would say, oh, pick the trash and say, sure, I'm going to pick the trash. And as I'm picking the trash, I'm going to recite you a Shakespeare poem and it does everything flawlessly. So that is exciting and scary because if AI models like OpenAI, the one that they built can help with the building software for robots and help robots have a better perception and understanding of the world, I think there's going to be a Cambrian, Cambrian explosion of robotics use cases. And I know some people are skeptic about humanoids, but if this trend that we have continues, you're going to have humanoids in the factories do all kinds of stuff. And that's just mind boggling because it has never happened before. That's why a lot of people just don't know how to think about it. I would say AI could be a great catalyst uh, for the robotic space. And I'm super bullish on it. How about from the insurance underwriting perspective? Does it turn the industry upside down? Not really. I would say it's not at the point where AI risk, and when I mean AI, I mean, let's say us using AI tools for work and those AI tools more functioning. I don't think it's at the point where it's become disruptive for the insurance industry. Most likely what's going to happen and it's already happening is that you're going to have the insurance industry underwriting AI companies. And as they underwrite, they're going to understand more and more about the performance of those uh, language models. And you can even already do that today through a bunch of tests, but it's only going to get better. And I think we're going to have we're going to reach the point where all of the AI companies will become insurable. They're going to be insured. And if their tools make a mistake, there's going to be an insurance coverage associated with it. And it's just a matter of time, similar to robotics. And there's going to be companies like Coop who will be also doing insurance for AI applications. If anything, probably easier to do it for AI than for robots, in my opinion. In that regard, it's going to be a similar path of just figuring out what metrics to look out for, how to collect data, how to understand the performance and being able to underwrite on the back. And there is a bunch of insur insurance companies or insure techs that are going to do it. Maybe one of them is going to be Coop. Well, to say point blank, one of them will be Coop. Let's call a spade a spade there. Yeah. How do you see the insurance markets for underwriting automation autonomy evolving over the next decade? So here's what I think is going to happen. I think there's going to be specialists. Maybe we'll get a competitor that's going to own most of the market when it comes to underwriting pricing and the data involved in that. And it's going to be a certain mode, which will primarily be in the tools that customers use, which will be hard to go away from those tools because they're going to provide a lot of value, not just insurance value, like the productivity value to customers. I would say give it a couple more years, 2025, 2026, you're going to see big insurance companies trying to figure out what to do in that space. And most likely they will go and try to do it themselves or will try to work with a company like Coop through the investment or through the reinsurance. I think it's going to be the investment or reinsurance will be the preferable way. Building this yourself is going to be, it's going to cost a lot of money. Then there'll probably be a point when there's going to be a bunch of new insured techs appearing, maybe two or three, they'll exclusively focus on robotics and try to compete with us with what we do. And they might take a certain niche or be some alternative to Coop, but I expect that we're going to own most of the market. That's my prediction. And then you either become profitable and continue growing the business and probably expand into adjacent areas from the original niche, or you 
do something else. That's what I think is going to happen. I think by 2026, you're probably going to have a lot more interest from the marketplace going into the robotics and partly thanks to AI, which now made a lot of use cases possible. And I think it's an exciting it's an exciting inflection point in the robotics insurance space. The market's endless at this point. Autonomy is going to become an economy. It's what we term the autonomy economy. So you're going to have a lot of risk under, right? You're going to have trillions of dollars of risk exposure to, to underwrite there. And as autonomy expands, I look forward to having you back on again to dive deeper and deeper into that. Perhaps we'll go into Japan with the pending driver shortage and what that looks like next time you're on from an insurance risk perspective. For today, Sergey, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners and viewers to take away with them today? One thing I want to mention is when you look at the new asset class like robotics, there is going to be the, the hardware part, the R&D part that makes everything possible. And then there's going to be the services part. And insurance is one of the financial services. So when you look at the intersection of robots and insurance, we're going to have tens of billions of robots deployed from industrial robots to humanoids eventually. And when you intersect that with insurance, where you can deliver 30% annual returns, and eventually insurance will be somewhat required for all the robotics companies and all the robots, just makes me very excited about the space. And I hope I can share that excitement with other people so they pay more attention to it. You're doing a really good job sharing that excitement. There's a lot of risk that has to be underwritten. There's a lot of expertise that has to be gained. Insurance companies and underwriters and reinsurers would do a great favor by calling yourself and the team at Coop to really learn what it is truly to underwrite the risk of autonomy. The future is bright. The future is autonomous. The future is Coop. Sergey, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy, autonomy economy today. Thanks so much.